Purple is a color we all associate with the global harmonized system. The first edition of GHS was adopted in December 2002 and published in 2003. Since then the Purple GHS book has been updated, revised and improved every two years as needs arise and implementation experiences are gained. The last revision was in 2017 and the GHS committee is already working on revision number 8. One of the experts in the GHS committee is Barbara Lentry Miller. She's here with us today. I would say a great opportunity for us to learn more about the work of the GHS committee and to get a sneak preview of what is in store for 2019. Barbara, each country implements revisions at their own pace. Uh, there are various opinions on this. Sometimes it's negative since it results in different levels of managing risks. Sometimes it's more positive since a different implementation rate may also be needed to allow local industry to manage risk without being overwhelmed with new changes. How do you perceive that? Mm. So as a, I, I work for a global company and for us it is very difficult. It causes us a, a fair amount of pain. The reason for that is when we have customer uh, questions about our GHS classifications, the first thing we have to do is understand what country do they hail from? Does their country have GHS implemented? If so, what version is it? So we not only have to understand our version, what revision we're on, but what revision our customer is on. And then we have to understand the variances and the similarities. At that point then, we, we move into the next phase because I'll tell you, our GHS classifications are normally correct. So then we move into the education phase, education and coaching, because many times the customer does not understand the complexities, only has a vision of their GHS. And so it's, it's all about helping the customer understand the differences, bringing them up to the level of understanding that they need to be to understand that our classification is correct, <laughs> but it may be a different version and for a different country. Talking about revisions, I mean, the USA is only at revision number three. We're already at number eight. Uh, what is your expectation for the USA? Will they leap forward or what can we expect? Yeah, so that is actually a, a, a question that we ask OSHA every time I go to a stakeholder meeting. And they have just recently attended the DGAC Winter Conference and we ask that question again. Their anticipation is that they're going to move to Rev 6. Now, having said that, they understand how long it takes to go from a regulation to uh, comments, comment to, rep rep to reply to the comments, and then to get to a final regulation. So they're referring to it as 6 plus. 6 plus means we think we're going to be aligning with Rev 6. Eh, we might be aligning to Rev 7. So Ultimately, they will not change the framework of the HCS 2012, but they'll, they'll uh, very carefully modify the, the provisions that must be modified to align to either 6 or 7. Let's take a closer look in one of the expected changes of the 8 revision in relation to combustible dust explosions. And a very important issue since globally many major hazard uh, accidents have happened with combustible dust explosions. Could you provide some insights on the causes of these explosions? The causes of combustible dust explosions are, are very complex. The good thing about this guidance, and this guidance for anyone who is interested, is Annex 11, Guidance on Other Hazards not leading to classification, which is in essence, in OSHA's terminology, hazards or combustible dust, right? So the guidance is very specific. It has a flow chart that actually walks you through how to determine if your material is a combustible dust or is not a combustible dust. It has a complete section on contributing factors and other contributing factors to combustible dust. So it's really focused on not only the identification, but the hazard assessment, the prevention, the mitigation, and the communication of combustible dust. So there's actually phrases that have been agreed to within Annex 11 that will show up in the Purple Book for countries to adopt in their hazard communication. The, the truly important part of this, I think, for, for global companies who are outside of the U.S. is that this really does connect the dotted lines between OSHA's HCS's additional hazard class called combustible dust 
and the Purple Book. Talking about global, I've heard that uh, it's a rumor at least that the UN is working on an uh, inventory. What are your expectations on this? Yes, um, my expectations are probably high. Uh, I, am, I am pragmatic in the fact that I understand it's going to take a long time. As a global manufacturer, we sell into every country. And what we find is that uh, opposed to having a harmonized system where a chemical sold today in one market is the same classification as another market, we find that some country lists of chemical inventories are much more conservative. Some countries are less conservative. We feel that it would be a benefit to all countries' hazard communication to have one global inventory. Granted, it will not be mandatory, um, just as the Purple Book is, is a guidance, not a mandatory, it's not a regulation, but especially for those countries who are coming on, to, on board to GHS, who don't have the resources to develop their own chemical inventories, to have a global inventory would, would be a huge benefit. But if you have to make such an inventory, that's a big effort. Uh, you talk about different uh, views, conservative, mm -hmm. non-conservative. Mm -hmm. Who would be the organization or which people would then decide how that would look like? It would be an incredibly laborious task. My comment is, look, there's a lot of industries out there who have already done this globally. Why can't we use this information? I, I take, for example, um, the International Organization of Fragrance Industries. All of the flavor and fragrance industries have agreed on the same classifications. It's been a, a, a very thorough search. That organization is not the only one. We need to use the power of the, of the organizations that are out there today globally to cut down the time frames. Barbara, thank you very much for this great interview. Um, it's good to see that experts like you are at the table with hands-on experience that make the dust fly and can translate theory into practical implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry.